I don't know what I would do. What someone needs to just, I don't know, follow me about the whole time and see what I do. <laughs> Any volunteers, listeners? <laughs> <laughs> um, that sounds like the worst job ever. People of the world. It is Bad Voltage, and we're here again, uh, back to our usual recipe of uh, blasting through a whole load of tech news that's been going on recently, so buckle up for that. But um, we're, we're joined today, of course, by my f- fearless compadres, Mr. Stuart Ian Langridge and Jeremy Beyonce Garcia. Um, and Not we, have to, <laughs> we have to make it very clear, of course, that, uh, that we're, we're getting closer every day by definition, because that's how time works, yes. to the Bad Voltage <laughs> live show in Pasadena at scale. So uh, make sure you get over to that. Check it out at the SoCalLinuxExpo.org, I think it is. Um, uh, we've got System76 and our brand new sponsor, Ticketmaster, are going to be helping to support the show. Ticketmaster, of course, and System76 have sponsored us in the past. Yes. Uh, it's on March the 8th, uh, 2019. Um, which is a Friday, and it's going to be an absolute riotous show. It's going to be a great time. We've 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 got most of the key concepts of the show locked down. We do, um, and it's going to be a, a bit of a rager. So uh, there'll be there'll be drinks there. There'll be food there. Um, all free, of course. Um, a great show. There's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't go there. Um, and of course, Scale is a wonderful conference, and they're they're hosting us. So go and check that out as well. Or you can go to badvoltage.org slash live and find out more. And there's also a discount code on there, which you can get for scale with a 50% discount. So check it out. Is there anything else I'm missing from Bad Voltage Live, fellas? Nope, I don't Very believe so. Well, not, there's a, not there's that bu- we can share publicly quite yet. No. Yeah, there's a bunch no. of stuff you're missing, but we're not going to say any of that because we know what it no. is. And you do not, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And that's why we're... The almighty and the all-powerful bad voltage. Uh, uh, actually, no, no might and no power. Um, so yeah, but go and check it out. It's going to be it's going to be really fun. And thanks again to, to Ticketmaster and Systems Seventy Six and the Scale team for for sponsoring the show. Yes. Totally. It's always a, it's always a ton of fun, uh, and I think you're all going to be in for a real fun surprise. So go and check it out. So we're going to blast through a load of news. Which one of you two idiots wants to start? I mean, given that introduction, probably you. Me? <laughs> well put. Okay. Well put, Jeremy, yes. <laughs> I don't like either of you. Um, all right, let's start with this then. Google apparently may be killing the back button in Android Q. Now, this doesn't sound like particularly exciting news, right? But uh, XDA, who are an Android nerd's site um uh, posted a video where they had um uh android pi which is the current version and for those of you who are unfamiliar with how this works on android if you have this little they call it a pill this little kind of icon at the bottom where when you press it it takes you to the home screen with all of your uh, application icons listed and if you slide left and right there you can slide between your currently open apps right and uh, But when you open up an app, there'll be a little back button will appear where if you need to go to a previous screen, you press the button and that's how it works. But what Google are playing with, it's not confirmed yet, is that if you go to, uh, if you open up an application, <coughs> instead there will be no back button and you'll swipe, that. you'll use the gesture left to swipe back and that's how it'll work. And it strikes me that for those people who don't really know much about gestures, which I'm guessing is most Android users, this will be the most confusing thing on the planet if you can't figure out how to get back to a previous screen. What do you guys think? I suspect their assumption is people are increasingly not using the back button. Uh, uh, Apps are increasingly not doing anything valuable with it. When they move from hardware buttons to software buttons, and then they move from having the bar across the bottom the whole time with a the back button bottom left the whole time into the new pill thing. We're increasingly seeing the back button being less of a gesture that people expect 
anyway. So I think what this is, is we want to take the back button away, but everyone will complain if we do that. So what we'll do is we'll keep it, but so it doesn't take up any screen real estate. So when someone says, where's our back button? You go, oh, you just swipe to the left on the assumption that people who are using it are semi-power users anyway. People are using the back button or semi-powerful users? I was going to say, do, out of curiosity, do you both use the back button? Yes, no. All it, the time. Really? So <laughs> okay. All the time. All the I, time. I, I don't very much, to be honest with you. Um, I do so if you're in Chrome and you're on a URL, what do you... Do you I do, close uh, tabs all the time? Nah, I do in the web browser, Yes. And that's reasonable. But the fact that the web browser needs a back button does not mean the operating system ought to provide it all the time for everybody. It's a it's a fairly... The, 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 the thing that Android did right from the beginning was they said, well, the way browsers work with the back button, apps in general ought to have that. And they had a point. They did. And it is useful in some other applications. But in practice, I find myself using it in the browser a lot where I have a mental model of what the back button will do. And in other apps, sometimes I'll use it, but exactly what the but back button is going to do. But in every app, like do, a news app, let's say, you, you read an article and you go back to the section that you were in. Or yes. if you're in an app and you go into the settings, you go back. Or if I'm working out, I, I start the workout, and then after I end it, you want to go back. Like, I, don't, app, I can't when, think of many when, apps you, where I don't use it, to be honest. Chrome aside. When you, load, when you, when you look at your email on your phone, app and you press an email subject to go and look at the content of the email... How do you get back to your inbox? That is actually a very good question, and I'm going to do it right now because I, I I don't have a clear picture in my head of what it is I do, which means it's become muscle memory. So let me see. Bear with right. Me. So there's yeah. that right. little yeah. arrow. If you I don't know if you use Gmail or not, but if you use okay. Gmail in the upper left, there's a essentially an app back button as opposed to the Android back button. They both that, do the same thing. That that's kind of the the um, I, I'm going to try this out now, but that's kind of the point I'm making. That applications which have back as a sensible part of their UI have tended to add a back button, at least partially for mental compatibility with iOS, which doesn't have an explicit operating system back button, and therefore apps have to provide it anyway. So bear with me, right? So I'm looking at my mail, and I'm going to go into a thing, and. Oh, you see, now I don't now because I'm being observed. I don't know what it is I would do. I I can see on the screen both the top left back button and the bottom left operating system one, and I don't know which one I would pick. Tra I think I know which one you'd pick because you are a person who has ranted on this very podcast multiple times about the 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 travesty of having to stretch your thumb longer than it should be on large phones. I'm guessing <laughs> you press the lower back button because I, it's closer. I, you don't have to. You could, probably can't reach the top left one. I right? can. I can reach the top button. That's why I've got the phone I've got. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm quite I'm quite prepared to go on your point. The problem is now because I I don't know what I would do. What someone needs to just. I don't know, follow me about the whole time and see what I do. <laughs> Any volunteers, listeners? <laughs> <laughs> um, that sounds like the worst job ever. I, 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 will, I will try and catch myself and write something on the form about what it is I do, but I don't know. But yeah, yeah I'm quite bad to believe that I use the, the hardware back button with the, the, the operating system back button for that bottom left. But I also think it would be relatively easy after being told once to just start swiping left instead. I mean, I got perfectly used to that with Ubuntu phone with no problem at all. Yeah, it lacks discoverability, but once you know about it, it's not that hard to build muscle memory on that gesture. That's true. The thing that concerns me is, um, I remember when the when we were building the Ubuntu phone and we didn't have a back button for a, a, a period of time, and it <laughs> made it almost impossible to use for a lot of people. Is I get the impression that gestures as a concept are by definition a bit of a power user con a power, power user notion. And they will take years to become normal in the... Um, like, I think some gestures, like an Android pulling down from the top of the screen, that's a gesture that I think people generally got the hang of. But yep. that's because it's been there since day one, from what I understand. Whereas, for example, when I was looking at the XDA video with the thing swiping left and right uh, around the pill um, to look at your open apps, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> and I would argue with that I'm a bit of an Android power user. 
Yeah, so, and there are gestures know, like swiping up from the bottom and so on, which a lot of people don't use. Um, yeah. So, but but I think I suspect that this is a lot of the apps which which require a back action have built a visible button into their UI anyway. So the only people this is really going to seriously damage are people who have a back action in their UI, which is important and are relying on the operating system to provide it for them, at which point they're going to have to redesign their UI, which is unfortunate. But remember, when you say it's but been But they there probably have that one, UI designed for iOS anyway. Well, exactly. If they're on iOS, then they've done it there anyway. And every day is day one for something. That's true. That's true. Deep, so, deep thoughts uh, there. All right. I can... I can almost feel our listeners certainly my wife who does listen to the show saying move on <laughs> all, our, all our ios listeners are going why is As it everyone hits the back, back button? button to get out of their podcaster <laughs> app because of this <laughs> segment <laughs> yeah. all right what's next i'm going to talk about a thing because i i can't decide whether this thing is actually quite clever or a disastrous waste of time it's called project alias Okay. And what it does is it fits over the top of, um, I believe it's just for the Amazon Echo, but I see no reason why it couldn't be for a Google Home as well. Or the, the blog post you link to, the picture is actually a home, so it must support the home. Oh, I thought it was just the Echo, but yeah, okay. Um, I, haven't, I haven't looked into the detail of it too much because, as I say, I can't decide whether it's stupid or not. What it is, is it's for people who are worried that their, their home assistant is listening to them and shipping everything they say up to the cloud the whole time. So it sits over the top of your home assistant and blocks the microphone. And then it is itself also listening to you. So when so you can tell it, you teach it what your wake word is, computer or OK Google or whatever. And then when it hears OK Google, it becomes transparent to sound. So the rest of the sound gets through to your home assistant. <laughs> right? Which... On the one hand is for stupid tinfoil hat paranoid lunatics. On the other hand, the thing that the the, the uh, bloke who's made it is suggesting it's useful for is things where your Google Home perpetually doesn't understand you or where you want to be able to say something short that the Google Home doesn't understand itself. So you teach this thing your little short word and then when you say the short word, it will then play out of its internal speaker into your Google Home, the actual trigger statement for Google Home. So you could just go, lights, and then it would hear that and then play internally, OK, Google, turn the lights on in the bathroom, which you wouldn't be able to hear. But it's like being able to create aliases, you know, like bash aliases or whatever, hence being called right. Project Alias. Now... I mean, this is obviously quite clever technology, but it's also stupid. <laughs> and I'm interested in what you think of it. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I understand. So is the assertion that people that are so worried for half the, for the privacy aspect of it, people that are so worried that a Google or an Amazon device are recording irrelevant ambient sound deliberately, but then will trust this thing? Presumably, well, the, the, you'd have to trust this thing to do its job of blocking the microphone. Um, you don't have to worry about trusting this thing to not talk to the internet, because as far as I'm aware, it's not connected to the internet. It's All its processing is on board. So all the aliasing and everything is stored on board, I see. Yes. So um, I, I am assuming that means that its recognition is either not great or very limited, or you have to train it or something like Dragon Naturally Speaking. I don't I don't know. I haven't looked into it in that much detail because, as I say, can't decide. You see, you two did the same thing I did. You both went, uh, and you kind of want to go, but that's thick. And then you go, oh, but it's sort of interesting, but it's stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's. It's interesting. You see, uh, as a I, am in, I am in a quandary about this whole. I like the kind of the hackery nature of it. Someone yeah, trying to that's cool. b build a thing which is. It feels like the sort of thing that you'd put together for a laugh over a weekend with your mates, and then someone went, hi, hey, this should be a product. I, I like that they describe it as a teachable parasite. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people like that. Uh, <laughs> I don't think any of them are teachable. 
<laughs> right, that's a good point. <laughs> Just a parasite. Um, from an aesthetic perspective, it looks like someone sprayed whipped cream all over the top of a Google Home, by the it, way. Yeah. It, it does. Uh, you know, um, I don't know, do you have this in the States? There's stuff called ice magic. Well, which when you've got an ice cream, you pour it's just like a syrup, and you pour it on top of the ice cream, and then it turns into solid chocolate when it hits the ice cream. Oh, that <laughs> stuff! Right. I remember that Magic Mountain, wasn't it called? Uh, it was called Ice Magic. There may have been more than one kind of it. I haven't seen yeah. it for years, presumably because the magic thing that made it be a syrup in the bottle and then turn back into chocolate when it hit the ice cream was dioxin or something, and now it's banned. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I, I haven't seen it since I was a child, but. Yeah. Um, um, the the way this thing looks over the top of your Google Home looks like the bottle of ice magic. I'll see if I can dig up a picture of it. It does. It does. Ice magic also sounds like a great name for a show, by the way. Um, <laughs> the, so, I mean, I kind of want to buy a 3D printer just to print one of these things. <laughs> it, yeah, it's... So... Cause Cause it's really just questions. a Raspberry Pi, a speaker, a mic, and a hilarious 3D printed thing on Instructables. Yeah, I mean, the one question I do have here is, so is the mic on a Google... I thought the mic on a Google Home was on the side of the unit. I didn't think it was on the top. Uh, you, now know this as, you now know as much as the, I do. I'm assuming it well, covers the mic. It also, one, so th this just plays like a white noise to yeah, it, drown it, out. So it doesn't actually disconnect the mic. Yeah, it basically it, plays a noise loud enough that it can't hear you yeah it, and when it, you say it's wake word it rep so it records your voice saying the wake word yes and then replays yeah. your voice now that i've actually read it no i just looked at my google home which is next to me and I, it looks like there's two microphones on the top on the left and the right side the one thing that i don't understand how this is going to work is you can control volume you control volume on the top of a google home by by sliding you know moving your finger on top of it so i'm guessing you will lose that with this thing oh presume i um do you use that I do all the time. No, bear with me. I appreciate you change the volume, but you do it by going and pressing a button like a caveman rather than just going, OK, Google, volume up. Well, I do, because uh, one of the main things that we use Google Homes for was in when we moved into our new place, instead of buying a stupidly expensive Sonos system, we have um, three Google Homes across the house that we group together when we play music. And that you can say... <laughs> it's right next to me, so I don't want to set it off. <laughs> uh, turn the volume, turn the music down, but it will do it at such a small increment that it will take you, you know, a minute and a half to get the volume down. Uh, so I just walk up to it and swipe. Yeah, you haven't so. tried OK Google Volume Seven or whatever. I don't even know if you can do that. The the echo, the echo has volumes between one and ten, so you can just tell it a number as well as saying volume up. Maybe you can. Yeah, actually, I never thought of that. That's a good point. I'll try that. <laughs> anyway, sorry, that, beside the point slightly, but yeah, I mean, as I say, I, I have no intention of getting one of these things. <laughs> uh, and if, and if I want my echo to respond to a custom command, I'll write a skill for it. But I appreciate that not everyone is able to do that. Right. Right. Yeah. No, interesting concept. I mean, it is. It is an interesting concept, I, I think. Yeah. So um, I, I, I would like someone to go and actually make one of these and let us know what it's like. Yeah. And, and, and actually, what would be brilliant is if, so if they made there, one, tested it out, made three more and shipped it to each of us, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fine. Uh, if you've got an Echo Dot version, I'm more than happy to test that out for you. <laughs> I can tell you one person who I live with. That narrows it down. Uh, who would be deeply unimpressed with one of these whipped cream things on the top of our Google Home. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, don't send me one. I know it's not going to go down well. But, yeah, if you get one of these, someone, make a little video demo in it. I'd love to see what it looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. That'd be quite cool, actually. Yeah. So, okay, right, next. what's next? Go on, Jeremy. Sure. Actually, I'll, I'll do two because they're both privacy related and we just did a, a privacy related show kind of or social yep. network related show. So the first one is pretty quick, but I think amusing. I, I, I'm sure you both are aware that Marriott got deeply packed. Uh, actually, they didn't. SPG did, but Marriott now owns SPG. So, but, right. so they're now giving you a way to confirm whether your personal details were stolen or not in, in that Starwood hack. And to do so, you need to submit your personal information to them via a form and they will get back to you. <laughs> So this I, is, I just this is very silly. 
Yeah. Uh, while, while I while I think about it, if you want to know whether um, uh, bad people are using your credit card, go to badvoltage.org slash credit cards and fill in your credit card number and date of birth and mother's maiden name, and we'll tell you whether that information shows up in anyone's database. <laughs> I just, I'd, like to make, I'd like to make it clear, by the way, that he's joking. So when somebody <laughs> sues us for trying to solicit people's credit card information, yeah, just just want to get that out there. Go, yeah. on, Jeremy. So I just I thought that was interesting. I, it never ceases to astound me when things like this happen. Like how that made it past anyone at the company at any level, from on the tech side or their DPA or DPO, whatever, uh, to to basically anyone within the company not saying this is a terrible idea. Can we not do this? Always astounds me, but I thought I mean, it was an interesting little. Has anyone actually filled uh, filled it in? I suppose there's an outside possibility. You fill it in, and then it just prints up in massive red seventy two point text. What are you nuts? Don't do this anywhere. Whoever <laughs> asks you for ever, it. right? Ever. Don't or do does it. it just say your details have been stolen now? <laughs> I'm not sure. Why don't one of the two of you go try? <laughs> it just it says he says yes. Your details have been stolen. Then it waits two seconds and then flashes up now underneath it like three dots <laughs> yes. again. Uh, yeah, and then and also related to the last show and a little and I don't know if this is just a coincidence or kind of a Bader Meinhof thing, but. Since we recorded the last show, the number of news articles I've seen related to Facebook specifically, but social networking in general, uh, Facebook has behaved like digital gangsters, says the UK Parliament. Yeah. Uh, a new study blames YouTube for the rise in number of flat earthers. There's legitimately dozens of seemingly unrelated news articles. So I don't know if I was paying attention more in the last week because we just did the show, or if there is a, a rising tide of resentment and, and vitriol towards social networks in general. But it seemed like it, it crossed my threshold from the normal noise of social networks are garbage to something more in the last week. And I just thought it was interesting timing. Curious yeah. if either of you noticed this. Uh, I've, been, I've been noticing it for a while, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, same I mean, we, we talked about the tech lash in the last show. And this is exactly it. It feels like we're getting somewhere close to a tipping point where... I mean, people have been sa people have been saying in a sort of a, um, a background radiation sort of way. Oh yeah, Facebook, don't they steal all your data and stuff? But no one's actually. People are sort of shrugging their shoulders about it. But now it's become just standard talk. Yeah, the, the meme associated with them is they steal all your data all the time, to the point where. It's gonna tarnish their brand. We talked about this quite a lot in the uh, in the prediction show at the beginning of the year. Yeah, yeah. that it's now indelibly <coughs> associated with their brand. And when you've got people like the um, the, uh, the Parliament here putting out a, a hundred and eight page report saying that they act like digital gangsters in the online world. Facebook acts only when serious breaches become public. Um, Zuckerberg claimed that Facebook has never sold user data. The report just goes. That is simply not true. <laughs> and this sort of pushback, uh, it does feel like we're hitting the point where something's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but something is. Yep. Yeah. The, the thing I thought was another interesting aspect of the, the YouTube one specifically is that a former YouTube engineer came out and said the reason that he quit was he was felt like he was working on some really interesting things. And if you listen to this song, what other songs would you like? And it would, he had access to so much data and interesting data sets that he really enjoyed his job. And then he realized that most of what his algorithm, not his, but the algorithm he's contributing to was used for in the end was someone watching some kind of weird skeptic video and then being sucked down the rabbit hole of conspiracy yeah. theorists and then turning into a conspiracy theorist. And, and it bothered him so much that he actually ended up quitting. You know, but I, I get that viewpoint, and there's no doubt that that's the case with uh, with YouTube, right? We've all seen it, and you can go down a multitude of different rabbit warrens, right? So, um, and you know, as, as an example, about six or seven months ago, I was doing some research into a particular method in sound engineering, and. What was really cool about YouTube was I looked up a specific topic and then it kept re recommending videos that, re that were related to that topic. And one of the things I love about YouTube is that you can actually end up getting a lot of really valuable material out of it because 
because it keeps recommending stuff that's generally r relevant and interesting to you. Of course, that can be used in a negative way. If you're researching crazy conspiracy theories, then it can fuel your well, paranoia about this, that, and the other. That's exactly so, the problem, right? I mean, I, I am in danger of being radicalized by YouTube into a guy who's really interested in wood turning, right? Because <laughs> I, th right. I, th I think it's fascinating watching these people making like vases out of wood on a lathe. I think oh, it's yeah. really cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, to the point where I've gone, could I fit a lathe in my flat? No, no, I can't fit a lathe in the flat. <laughs> you need <laughs> a mini lathe. If they just made a slightly smaller one, it'd be great. Um, <laughs> um, but it's kind of okay if you get radicalized into watching loads of Kurtzka's art videos and caring a lot about science. I'm fine with that. Um, right. But there is a question about. If we have this brilliant technology for taking a thing that someone is interested in and making them obsessed about it, should we be allowed to use it? Because the same thing happens with stuff like games. I mean, we, we've talked a lot in the past, and lots of people talked a lot in the past, about um, the way a lot of games work now is more towards the pay-to-play thing and driving addictive behaviour and trying to get away from the screen more because a lot of uh, a lot of applications, a lot of the way things work, is designed to keep you drawn in. And it's all part and parcel of the same thing to me, essentially driving addictive behaviour. Yeah. And I'm not sure. It feels like a terribly powerful weapon. And saying this terribly powerful weapon is okay as long as we only promise to use it for good things is not necessarily a view I have a great deal of sympathy with. I don't want to compare it to the obvious thing here, but there's a lot of the yeah. same um, a lot of the same thought processes and a lot of the same arguments being made on one side or the other of that debate. Well, and the, th well, and the thing is as well is, look, you know, it's essentially getting back to this topic of um, which rabbit warren is okay and which rabbit warren isn't okay, yeah. right? So, for example, the example that, that Jeremy gave, in, I, I saw that I haven't read the piece that was that was published about YouTube kind of validating flat earthers, whatever. But I'm not going to deny that I went down the flat earth rabbit warren, and it wasn't because I think that any this flat earth theory is true. Of course, it isn't. It's because I was enjoying looking at, and watching these people. I wanted to see how these people try to justify a plainly absurd concept. Like there was a video that went up. I think it was Vox Media put it up of a guy who went to a flat earth conference. It was like a 20 minute video. And it was absolutely fascinating because I think it's the same reason why a lot of people like to watch documentaries about serial killers. It's not because they're actually serial killers or they want to do that or they even justify that. It's looking at the world through a set of eyes that is just so bizarre. I think people are fascinated by that stuff. So I think a lot of people go down that rabbit warren. I think we've all done it. I remember watching a whole bunch of videos on YouTube about people who think the moon landings were fake. Again, it's not, it's not justifying it, but it's fascinating. And I think we're all, we all do that in some way. And I don't think, even if YouTube managed to engineer their their algorithm to not send you down a certain type of rabbit warren, such as the, uh, such as the, uh, the flat earth thing. We do it elsewhere. I mean, people have talked about this with Wikipedia. Like you just end up going from one thing to another thing in Wikipedia. We do it with books. We do it with TV shows. Like it's just human nature that if you, if you, if your interest is peaked in something, whether it's because you become radicalized around that belief or whether it's just because you're strangely curious about it, you're going to hunt that stuff out anyway. I just don't know how solvable it is, you know? Yeah. Uh, not a bad point, I suppose. I mean, I'm not sure I'm in favor of making sure there still are serial killers just so we can preserve interesting documentaries about them. And I feel the same way about flat earthers, to be honest. Well, that's, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that I'm not, of course I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that like people, you know, forever have been bear, interested in a side of life that is different. Bear with me. And, I, bear, and, bear with me. I, I, I think the distinction is, and this is a pretty arguable point. So if I get pushed back on it, I'm then okay. But I don't think watching things about serial killers makes people into serial killers um possibly I there are <laughs> no ideally not no but i mean people have been making that argument you know um playing violent video games makes you violent and there are arguments on both sides of that i personally don't believe it but 
you know, I'm paired to listen yeah. to people who do say that. But I do right. think watching loads of documentaries about flat earthers might make you a bit more of a flat earther. If you honestly went into that and you came out the other end going, no, I still don't believe a word of it. There wasn't, there weren't any good points made there. I'd be surprised. You've got a much more rigorous and robust mind than most people. Half the reason I try to avoid watching stuff like that is because I find myself thinking, huh, that's a good point. And then I've got to go away and do a bunch of research to prove to myself, actually, no, that's not the case. This is why. And most of the time, right. too lazy to do that. And so you've then got a little bit of your head the whole time going, but what if we never did land on the moon? And it just materially harms my ability but, to think. But, <laughs> And this is, this is what makes me nervous about the, the overarching argument of, <clears throat> I think you make a good point, right? But the, what makes me nervous about the overarching argument of, well, we shouldn't allow certain types of media through because it might radicalize people is exactly the same argument that people were making back in the 80s that rock music was turning people into devil worshippers. It's exactly the same argument that video games are turning kids into school shooters and this, that, and the other. Now, I'm sure that in some small cases that is happening, right? I'm sure that there is some kid who has played a little too much Call of Duty or Battlefield and has wanted to act out what they think is a cool scenario, and there's been terrible consequences, right? But what worries me about this a little bit is 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 to the point we've made is like who gets to decide that and there are many cases where where people can have normal levels of curiosity that you know without being radicalized and and there is also a certain argument of like with the flat earth thing like the flat earth people deserve to be able to have their voices heard i think that i think we should allow that but the point is is that we should encourage people to have a critical mind and you'd be able to look at that like I've, I've looked at all of their arguments. I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> but at least I had the opportunity to listen to their arguments, and, and I, that's important. And I think it would be perfectly reasonable if YouTube's algorithm, for example, said, are you interested in flat earth stuff? We will do our best to show you maybe some more videos that bolster that viewpoint, and maybe some videos that oppose that viewpoint. Yeah, that's what I want to see. I want to see people, I want them to see YouTube presenting both sides of the debate, of any debate. Here's a pro-gun rights video. Here's an anti-gun rights You've got to be a little bit careful about that, because then you get to the situation where 99% of people say a thing is and 1% say it isn't and the 1% gets an unfair hearing. This is the climate change thing, right? Where on the news, you, you do a report on climate change and you've got to encourage one person who says climate change isn't real at all for balance, in air quotes. Whereas actually it's not balanced at all. You'd have 99 people explaining the problems and one person saying it doesn't happen at all. So that's a hard problem. I, I don't like... Um, giving the appearance of balance by just presenting both hang sides on, of the on, argument hang, and saying hang, hang nothing to do with us. But is your argument there that you shouldn't give airtime to the niche view? Is that your basic point? Uh, my argument... Because if you're, basi- if you're basically saying that, then we should have been silenced in the early days of the open source world. My argument is that the, the, the people who hold a niche view should get airtime in proportion to the size of their niche. So uh, I would expect at um, if there were a hundred software conferences, at one of them there'd be someone saying you should all open source all of your software, and that's about the proportion we did get. We didn't start showing up yeah. at CES for a long time. I think yeah, I but, think that's fair. But that's it, a good idea actually. But, the, the the proportion, yeah. But there but there would have been people sitting there in two thousand and two. I mean, probably us among them, to be honest with you, saying it's not fair. Every time there's a debate about um, software licensing methods at one of these conferences, there ought to be an open source person in there. We're being silenced because of it, and right. and the conference organisers would have said, no, not really, because your view is not that important. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I think we may have hit on something. I know we're talking about the social thing, social media thing again. The presentation of other people's views, I think, is is critical to to, to this. But I also like your point about the the proportion of it, and that would also encourage, like, if you have a a, a less common view, right? If you are Linux supporter in nineteen ninety seven, right? Linux supporter in twenty nineteen, right? Well, Linux desktop support in 2019. <laughs> Linux in, ter- in, the, in the commercial world, is, in the server world, yeah, is, no, no, fair play, is doing yes, okay. Yes. But, but if, yeah, if you're a Linux desktop supporter in, in 2019, um, I think 
being able to get that visibility, I think will also make you more efficient in the way you deliver your message mm, in a way. It's a reasonable point. What, what do you think, Jeremy? But, yeah. No, that's a reasonable point. I think we're fixing social media one show at a time. That's wow. brilliant. Here it is. Well, what's our next piece of news? Is it about social can media? Some, <laughs> can I share something a little bit lighter? Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of the best headlines that I've ever seen. And the headline is Tinder style app for cows designed to help the meat market, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is, is magnificent. So uh, I want to read a little quote from this article. I, so, sorry, I didn't put into this where I sourced this. So I, I forget where it was, but people will be able to find this following the example of Tinder, which I'm sure all of you know what that is. Uh, UK farming startup Hectare has launched its own equivalent for livestock and called it. Pr- Here it comes, people. Tudder. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the app features data profiles of animals from 42,000 UK farms in an effort to help farmers find the perfect breeding partner for, the, for their cattle. Farmers can view pictures of bulls or cows and swipe right to show interest. <laughs> Hector Agritech, which also runs online, uh, an online grain marketplace. That sounds amazing. Grain decks. What a Jesus. Can you imagine working there? Says its aim is to, for reinventing farm trading and making farmers' lives easier. It says it's raised more than $3.8 million from investors and organizations, including grant funding from government schemes, while apparently some famous tennis player called Andy Murray is listed as one of the investors. I think the idea of this is quite interesting because it's clearly that the notion of swiping right has become just... We talked about gestures, a gesture a- for approval. Absolutely, <laughs> it, it has. And I think the UI is its a good model. Somewhere on my list of things, I think I've talked about this before, is using the Tinder swipe left, swipe right UI for modelling things like which cocktails I've drunk. I'd love to have a cocktail app which um, you swipe right um, for, yeah, I like that one, left for no, I didn't like that one. And then it can look at that and give you recommendations for other things that you'd probably like based on the stuff that you've liked and the stuff that you haven't. So you go to a different uh, bar yeah. and go, I'd like to try, you know, the thing says try a, a honey, honey and hazelnut old-fashioned. So you'd have, I like this, I didn't like this, and I haven't tried this yet. And then the second tab would show you all the ones you haven't tried yet that it thinks you'll like based on what you have liked and haven't. And I think that'd be a really yeah. good model. I mean, I, I've been, I've had this vague plan to build this for years and I've just never done it. But yeah, I, but, that's quite a cool idea. I mean, I can imagine you liking it for gin, Jono. Here are different types of gins and you go, I like that one, I didn't like that one, like that one, didn't like that one, haven't tried yeah. that one. And then it recommends um, uh, gins that it thinks you'll like based on other ones it thinks you like and then tells you where you can buy them, gives you a buy button in the app. Tap that. Um, oh, yeah. The app owner takes 1% off the topper's profit. And you do it, I, I, you do it I, yeah. with just, you know, um, Amazon affiliate code. You can sit down and write that in a weekend if you wanted to. This whole thing is, 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 is intellectually interesting to me because, and I think all three of us, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's different with you, App, because you're single, but, like, I, but I've been married for 10 years, so I skipped the, I missed the swipe left, swipe right app generation thing. Like it was basically. You, you had to go, you, you had to go, you had to go meet people in a bar like the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. It all seems a little too convenient. <laughs> but you know, whatever. Uh, what else do we have? No, I, 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 I do think that's it. I'm not sure I'm particularly interested in Tada. To be honest, but I, I I like the idea of taking that 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 model and mapping it onto other things. Um, yeah, a a slightly more serious one. Um, I was reading a thing by Bruce Schneier, and it was talking about uh, exploits for existing applications, existing operating systems, and companies who will buy them from you. And so if you come up with um, an exploit for the latest version of iOS or for WhatsApp or something like that, there are companies out there who will buy them off you basically in order to bundle them up and sell them to governments and things. And they'll pay you a million dollars for that sort of exploit. And if you go and fill in one of these bug bounty programs and submit it, you might get $200 or a T-shirt or something. (laughs) Um, It seems a bit kind of unbalanced and... We're leading people towards going, hey, I can make a quick buck off of this. And we're essentially relying on security people's integrity to not do that. 
My question is, is right. that is that a problem or is that just, you know, unavoidable? Hasn't this happened forever? I, I don't know. It's basically, it's, it's basically uh, extortion, isn't it? Well, no, 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 no. I mean, I, I, I don't know that. The, the point is that you're not going to Apple or Facebook with WhatsApp or whatever and saying, if you don't give me a million dollars, I'll publish this. They're explicitly selling it to a company who will continue to keep it secret and bundle it up and then sell it on. Um, the speculation is that it goes to governments who want to break into that kind of want to break into this kind of system to uh, monitor their citizens or whatever. But maybe it's other companies or industrial espionage or oh, whatever. Right. But, but that's the point. I mean, the, the fix, it's not the fix that he outlines in the in the post, I think, would immediately fix it if if that was something that the government wanted to fix. I also think because there's a handful of state agencies that really have the resources to pay a ton of money for these, and they're pretty well-known actors. They already have the resources to find these exploits on their own, right? So while it's great if you find a zero-day in, in iOS, Zeridium will give you $2 million. China is able to pay way more than $2 million to get that to find that exploit first anyway. So his idea of having a government pay for all of them immediately at a high rate and just open-source them is interesting and in that it gets rid of part of the problem. But I think when you, when you have a couple of, of, I don't want to say unlimited budgets, but a couple of actors with very, 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 very large budgets who are highly incentivized to find the exploit first, I, I don't know how much of an issue this is because they're uh, already incentivized. Uh, well, you see, the, I think the thing there is not so much that it stops those countries who are highly incentivized to find them first. It's that if you offer a million dollars to it um, for it to people who want to do this legitimately rather than who are doing it in order to make the million, then you get a whole bunch of other security people who are also going to pursue these bugs, will find them, they get paid a million dollars, then they get open sourced, at which point... The companies behind them fix the problem, and then China or whoever don't have that exploit anymore. Ideally, what you want to do is you want to stop anyone finding these exploits, right? But if right, well, that, that was if the fix that he posted actors, in, in the yeah, post you linked to. Yeah, if if some bad actors are going to find it anyway, then if we incentivize a bunch of good actors to <coughs> also find it, then a public exploit becomes useless because it gets fixed. Right. So how do we incentivize good actors to find it? Oh, to pay them a million dollars, exactly as Schneier says. But that's why I thought that was quite an interesting solution. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what, what is the legality on this, right? These exploits. I mean, I don't even know the answer to this question. Like, if, if, if somebody finds an exploit, let's say, you know, like the, fa the FaceTime bug thing, that that... 14-year-old yeah. found, right? Um, if that isn't submitted back to Apple, you know, so this is, this is a known exploit, a known issue, and someone sits on it or sells it, is that illegal? Depends dramatically on where you are and the laws. Um, in general, knowing about an exploit for a thing, not illegal. Um, but things like the um, DMCA kind of get in the way of that a bit well um, yeah but, but, knowing but, but, about it can't be illegal otherwise it would basically make all security research illegal yeah, but what about if you if you if you have something and then you sell it again i don't so you're, see why you're essentially you're you're weaponizing something I, you're selling it to someone i don't see why selling a thing would be illegal the, the thing that you do with that exploit is either illegal or against the company's terms or whatever, depending on the local right. laws in your in your area. But I can't see how selling knowledge of an exploit to someone else is in itself illegal. In itself unlawful. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, don't know. Be interested to hear thoughts from people who do know about that. Yeah, I'm not sure if we... <laughs> yeah, we, we, we certainly don't. Um, that one I do not know. Okay, John. What's next? Or Jeremy. Oh. Or Jeremy. Jeremy, do you have anything? Or do we uh, go? The the only other one I had was the Google Maps just accidentally exposed Taiwan's secret missile sites. Did you see this one? No. <laughs> so they released an Oops. updated. Yeah. Ex well, that's the thing is given uh, where Taiwan is with China, um, I, I suspect a lot of people were scrambling. But the, it's actually pretty close up if you look at the article, which we can link to in the the show notes. The the 
level of detail, I, I imagine, alarmed a lot of people within Taiwan pretty immediately. Just a bit, yes, I should say so. Um, I uh, this is interesting. <laughs> I yeah. read. I have a similar story, but my source for this is a thriller novel, so I don't know whether it's true or not. Um, <laughs> but the, 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 the impression I have is that the uh, it, it wasn't the point of the story. The um, a character in the story just related it as a thing they knew about, and the impression you have is that the author heard this story from someone real, but it could be entirely fictional. But the theory was this is um, in the Middle East. And the guy talking was Iranian or Iraqi or something like that. And he said that um, he, uh, he'd looked on Google Maps and, and you could see positions of various buildings that you might want to bomb, basically. Um, but those buildings on the ground weren't actually quite where the map said it was. And the question then is, did someone in the American government or wherever, ring up Google and say, do us a favour, move these buildings half a mile to the left, will you? So people can't use your map as a targeting device. Oh, uh, that's interesting. I have no, as I say, I have no idea whether it's true or not. It seems like the sort of thing where I wouldn't have that much difficulty in believing it to be the truth. <laughs> but this is utterly hearsay. I cannot stress this enough. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, um... The, the the fact that this didn't happen here, presumably the Taiwanese government did not ring up and say, OK, you can put the missile sites on, but just move them, you know, a mile and a half to the left. But I don't know whether that's because it, it works if you're the American government and not the Taiwanese government or whether it doesn't happen at all or what. But it is interesting, this this conflict between open information for everybody and stuff like this, because obviously... What do you do about this? It's not like you could have like a little cloud over the map saying you aren't allowed to see what's here because you might as well just write missile silo on the top of it anyway. <laughs> Although that's what they do for in the US. If you, if you go over areas that are classified, it just doesn't show up. Oh, really? So you still know where they are. You just don't know what's there. You don't know exactly what's there. So, it's like, so you know that thing, um, what's it called? The cloud to butt extension where... Um, you, you install it in um, Firefox or Chrome or whatever, and every time it sees the oh, word yeah. cloud on a web page, it changes it into butt. <laughs> I've, I've, right. I've not seen this glorious extension you speak of. There, there, um, there, there are a whole bunch of them, Something which, um, the ones which turn millennial into perfectly ordinary person and stuff like this. Right? It's fascinating how much it changes your view of the stuff you read. Um, but presumably there's no reason why you couldn't write an extension like that for Google Maps, which just takes unidentified area and changes it into missiles here and a big exclamation mark or words to that effect. <laughs> you know what? You 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 write that. <laughs> you first. <laughs> you may, may may maybe not, maybe not. Um right, John. Um I, I, I this one's maybe interesting. I thought it was kind of interesting and this is I think the final one that I've got is uh, apparently, Reddit users are less valuable than other social media networks. So this is, again, go back to social media. So if you thought we were done with that, <clears throat> not yet. Uh, oh, this is, new. this is news. It's not just your opinion. I mean, I'm prepared to buy this as an opinion. <laughs> no, this is news. Uh, uh, Reddit's latest, latest funding round apparently values its users at a lower price than any other network. Um, they raised $300 million in a Series D investment. And I think... If I remember correctly, like there was a bunch of that money came from China because there's been a lot of controversy around this on Reddit itself. Um, and that gives the company a valuation of $3 billion. Uh, now, CNBC, CNBC had previously reported that the company's annual revenue topped $100 million, um, according to sources familiar, uh, with around 330 uh, million monthly active users. So that would make the... Average revenue per user around 30 cents, which is less, apparently, than other networks. And it got me thinking more about the notion of, like, the actual value of an individual user and where that fits into the scheme of things. I don't know what the actual value of of other... I mean, you could go and figure it out based on the same kind of data, but I just thought it was an interesting little tidbit of information that, you know, each user on Reddit is worth about 30 cents. Um some people, I think, are worth considerably less than that. <laughs> but some people are worth considerably more than that. So, yeah, yeah that um, was it, really. Yeah, I mean, given uh, the nature of Reddit, this doesn't surprise me. I don't know. 
Yeah. Right. Um, Twitter's, for example, its average um, annual revenue per user is about nine dollars forty-eight. Apparently, uh, fa- what? F- Facebook seven dollars thirty-seven. Uh, Snapchat two dollars and nine cents. Pinterest two dollars eighty. So Reddit is a lot S- less, significantly. Wow, that's fascinating. And what I find fascinating personally is I get way way more value out of Reddit than any of the other social media networks. Yeah, but apparently uh, Reddit doesn't get prob- way more value out of I, you, it turns out. Right, I don't, I, yeah. and I don't think it does. In frankly. a lot of ways, though, I, I really don't know that I see Reddit as a social network. Right. Really? No. What? I, I, I'm interested as how you're drawing a line, then. What, uh, what, uh, what line are you drawing that puts Reddit on one side of it and Twitter and Facebook and YouTube on the other? I also don't consider YouTube a social network. Don't you? Okay. Um, I don't. I don't consider YouTube a social network. I mean, I, th- I consider Reddit a place where people self-organize into groups and, and consume information. It's There's a really platform. no component of there being a social connectedness. Like, Facebook is about the connections you have to other people. In Reddit, you have a user login, but it's not really used to connect to other people. You're associated with reddit communities and subreddits yeah. you're not you're not the association is not people and to be a social network to me the association should be right. people it's one-to-one versus one-to-many in many ways right social networks i think with your definition jeremy is that you're is that you're following an individual it might be nbc news but it might be Stuart language but you're 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 following and you're engaging with the individual whereas with 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 reddit you join the gin community Yes. So, well, I, I, I would agree with you. That's how I think of it as well. I mean, I also don't consider Linux questions a social network, and I would consider Reddit more along the lines of a forum than a more than than yes. Facebook. So, unless you consider all fora social networks, which is a pretty broad definition, uh, my, I, I consider um, Reddit well outside the realm of a social network. Well, my my dividing line, to be honest with you, um, given that we've been talking a lot about social networks being troublesome. My dividing line is not really between um, is something a social network or isn't it? Is, is it troublesome or isn't it? And my de- based on the discussions we've been having, I think my definition for is a thing potentially troublesome is do the company who run it exert some level of control over what you get to see or not? Do they make the decisions about what's important to you or do you? So Linux questions, for example, if I go there, LQ doesn't decide these threads are important to you based on stuff you've read before and these threads aren't. It doesn't attempt to push you in a direction for whatever motive, whether that whether that motive is to maximise your happiness or to maximise your clicks or to maximise the number of people who come to the site or whatever. That, I think, is what I'm increasingly seeing as problematic and and Reddit does that. So you're, you're defining in the as, default is, is mode, it though. bollocks and controlling? <laughs> I mean, in the default mode, you go to a subreddit and say, I want, like, to use Jono's example, I want to know about gin. I go to the gin subreddit. And They're not controlling what you see. It's sorted by upvotes. Uh, yeah. it, it's, uh, do you know how the Reddit formula works? Well, it depends if you're going by trending or hot or... Which, con- is, which is my point. Controversy, depending on yeah, how, you where, where, where you are in the world. But you choose that. Um, yeah. I, I'm prepared to bet you how many users did it say they had? 330 million. Yeah. I, I'd be shocked to bits if more than 20% of those users fiddle with that. I read it's a pretty technical community who are prepared to know about that. Most people use the default view. You know that as well as I do. Yeah, but I mean... <sighs> I, I would what argue, the default view? given the fact that the majority of the complaining I see about Reddit is on Reddit itself. Yeah, but that's because you're not looking that, anywhere else for it. What everyone else says about Reddit is, oh, God, Reddit. There's no, <laughs> there's no need to complain about it. No, but what I'm saying is I, I, I would argue that there's a lot of material on Reddit critical of Reddit. Oh, totally. Yes, absolutely. And I would say that, therefore, that there is a limited amount. I think there are, I actually think Reddit are a pretty reliable source when it comes to... 
genuinely showing the stuff that people care about. To be clear, I now there are exce- there are exceptions to this because there was a meme recently that was critical of the Chinese. I think it was that was removed. Uh, to, right? be, to, <laughs> so. to be clear, right when I said um, potentially problematic because they exert the control over what you see rather than you, I did not say that they're actually doing that or that even if they are that they're mendacious in doing it. The point about You're L- that they could. The point about LQ but, uh, is LQ is not going to radicalize me in unless... any way. Because you're not exa- you're not trying to push me in any direction at all. You're just like whatever people post, you yeah, see it. Could. That's it. By your definition, he could. No, because there's nothing like that at all. He has no algorithmic timeline. He, if he started implementing it, then yeah, then LQ ends up the other side of the line. But it's not even. But isn't, so there's no sort mode. Maybe I misunderstand Reddit, which is entirely possible. But there's no sort mode that will suggest you things outside of that Reddit. Based on you, what you like or dislike, it's they will show you. If you go to the Jin Reddit, they'll show you either best, which my understanding of best is basically upvotes minus down votes. Top is just upvotes, and hot is upvotes over time with the skew towards recently it's, recency. Yeah, but the the main key there is always number of people in that sub subreddit that have upvoted it. Yeah, not you have a bunch of likes and dislikes that we've tracked you all over the web. No, no, no. So we think you're going to want to see this. It's thing. not doing it on um, an individual basis. I completely admit that. Yes, and and Reddit is much closer to that line than something where they are explicitly fiddling with your timeline. Um, I think. In my head, and I'm, I'm not sure I've worked this out quite right. I mean, we've been having this discussion now for three or four shows, and it's still forming in my head what I think about this. But yep. at Reddit, I think those pressures act at a subreddit level, at a group level. Exactly as you both said, it's about getting together in groups. So it's not so much someone individ- you know trying to work out what's important and what isn't based on your likes and dislikes it's the subreddit as a whole decide on things which is why you can't go and have a an interesting nuanced discussion about Donald Trump's business practices in R the Donald I and Reddit's argument about this is well, at the level of the whole of Reddit, you get balanced discussion, even if individual subreddits are not. Yeah, but there are, there's always going to be, you're always going to have toxic individuals and you're going to have toxic groups. I mean, that's just, that's, human, that's humanity. You get, you'd, you'd have the same issue. I'm sure that Jeremy's over the years had to deal with some trolls on, on Linux questions, right? Sure. There's, yeah, absolutely. there's people on, on, on Twitter. That's just humanity. I don't know. Well, no, hang on. But, make... but Jer- Jeremy, um, but instead of dealing with those people by pushing them out, you could have created a forum, right? A, a sub forum as part of LQ and called it Say What You Want in here and then just said, no, go ahead. As long as you can find it to there, it's not a problem. But you didn't do that, right? Kind of did. Really? I mean, there's a general forum that isn't a technical forum. Are you, yeah, but, you, but you're not saying anything goes in here. Oh, no, right. That, and, and, sure. and, that, and that's my point. Um, Jono, when you're saying, yeah, it's just human nature that just happens, maybe, but up until five or six years ago, it didn't seem to be having that much of an effect on the world. I don't know whether it's because it was just more diffuse now or whether, as we've talked about before, people now have a megaphone which they didn't have before or maybe we've all got less tolerant to it or what. I, I don't know. I don't I'm not understanding your point. You're saying that you're saying that the 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 the, the, the trollish type of people are having more of an impact in the world. Is that what you mean? Yes. Well, I, I I don't know. I mean, I I would say yes and no to a degree. Reddit's a weird weird example because it is. It's 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 not. It's certainly nowhere near as ubiquitous as Twitter and Facebook and everything else. Agreed. Right and. By definition, I think different networks will attract different types of people. And I think you get a broader set of, you know, more kind of te- not necessarily technical people, but certainly people more who are more comfortable with computers and phones and stuff like that, logging into Reddit. Because it's, it's, you know, there's a bit more of a, of a leap to understand how yeah. it works. I mean, less so, than they, yes, less so than they used to be. In a world in which one in 20 people on Earth has a Reddit account, well, which um, they're 330 million monthly active users. That's that's one in 20 people. That's a lot. Right. It, it, it is. But, and I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't see it. As, I, th- I see it as a, a social network in the definition that it allows people to engage with each other and have conversations. It's a, it's a discussion platform. It is like a forum, but it, I, I think it's a little different 
you know, but anyway, whatever. I think, um, I think we need to end the show <laughs> for two reasons. One, <laughs> I'm hungry. Two, I think people are bored shitless of us talking about social media. <laughs> no, more, um, no more talking about social media. Um, but um, we do yeah, I, always I say we, hear what I say we do a, a no social media moratorium. Yeah. We're going to put ourselves in a timeout when it comes to social media. Um, so anyway, so uh, follow us on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> check, no, but let us know what you think about all che- of this stuff. Check out show. our Instagram. Have we got, I don't think we've got an Instagram, have we? I don't think we have Instagram. We're not that cool. No. <laughs> no. Um, but um, once again, um, Bad Voltage Live, Pasadena, 8th of March. Um, it's going to be a great show. Hope you can all get there. Um, and uh, thank you again to System76, Ticketmaster, and, of course, Scale for making this happen. We're really looking forward to it. It's going to be a good time. There will be a great show. There'll be, there'll be free drinks and food and all kinds of good stuff happening. So go and check it out, badvoltage.org slash live. Um, I think that's it. That is it. Fellas, I think. And I maybe think... on the next show we'll do another meaty segment. That was fun on the last one. So Yeah, yeah I, we we'll should. See. We should probably do that more often. We haven't done enough of that. So. Although, after all this news, we had one news thing that was suggested by a community member, and we went ahead and did all the news items in the article in the document except for that one. So, um, uh, well, the reason I didn't bring that up we're, was we're uh, sorry, Greg. Yes, we're sorry, we're, we're, we're sorry, Greg, who asked about five G, but uh, but that's because I basically haven't had time to research it. Yeah, so, I haven't either. So I don't I don't know what I think about that. I could just go five G, one more G, isn't it? That must be okay. <laughs> Why don't we, um, let's make a promise to Greg. Thanks, Greg Lowe, for, for sharing that. Um, we will look into it and we'll share some comments on that in the next show. So. Yep. Let's do it. Alrighty. Bye, everyone. Ooh.